Welcome to the first event of the year. It's good to see everyone here. And I'm delighted to have Professor Ambassador Kenneth Yellowwoods here. Uh, now, we in fact had Professor Yellowwoods teaching for us for quite a few years, and then he went off to Dartmouth uh, for what were you then? Five years? Eight years. Eight years, my goodness, time flies. Um, heading the uh, Dickey Center there for what's the uh, Dickey Center for Internet? International Understanding? International Understanding, which is a you know a research center there. Um, he's had a distinguished career in the State Department. Um, he served uh, several times in Moscow, right? Um, and of course, he was ambassador both to Belarus and to Georgia. Both um, difficult uh, postings, I guess, for different for reasons. reasons. <laughs> for different reasons. For different reasons. Uh, and uh, he was the recipient of the Ambassador, Ambassador Robert Fraser Award for Peacemaking and Conflict Prevention. I'm sure that not too many people know who Ambassador Robert Fraser was, but he was one of our outstanding diplomats who was killed in the Balkans. Anyway, uh, we're delighted to have you with us today. You're a great expert on the Caucasus, and it's a great title. Pay attention to the Caucasus. Thank you very, very much, Professor Stan. Um, in fact, I, I always regard you as part of the reason I ended up at Dartmouth because you were a wonderful referee for me, and that, that was one of the reasons I was told afterward uh, that I got the job at Dartmouth. But uh, coming back to Georgetown is a pleasure for me. Uh, I really enjoy teaching here. I love working with Professor Stenton and the wonderful uh, other folks who are here. Uh, and most of all, I, I enjoy the students. Uh, I, I really, really, really am impressed with the students, and I just love to come back and, and engage you. I'm going to be talking today um, about uh, the caucuses, pay attention to the caucuses. Uh, it's interesting because I use that title uh, for a magazine article, uh, I think it was Orbis, uh, eight years ago. And uh, that, I wouldn't change it at all, uh, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's an area that is understudied, um, underexamined, and, and certainly not paid enough attention to. And it's an area um, that I'm not going to say that uh, something's going to explode there tomorrow, but there are three situations which are, I think, very, very worrisome and really ought to be closer to the top of, of the list of policy makers, despite you know, all the major headaches uh, you know, that, uh, that they have to deal with today. In 2008, I co-wrote an op-ed uh, which we were predicting a, a war between uh, Georgia and Russia. We wrote this in June of 2008. And uh, it was very clear uh, that something bad was about to happen. Still, still much to my regret, uh, I don't think enough was done you know, to help uh, prevent that situation from degenerating into hostilities uh, in August. And I'm not saying you know, now that a Russia-Georgia war repeat of what happened in August 2008 is about to happen again, but I'm simply going to point out you know, a situation which I think, uh, as I mentioned, three dangerous situations, uh, any one of which could, could at some point uh, erupt. And I'm going to start with uh, Georgia. Uh, Georgia has parliamentary elections uh, coming up on October 1st. Uh, I don't know if any of you are following it, but uh, the presidency of Mika, Misha, Misha Saakashvili, who's been president since uh, the Rose Revolution in 2003, has been, on the whole, a very positive development. Uh, the many significant reforms, corruption has been cleaned up, it's much easier to do business. Uh, state structures are now really state structures. They were very weak when I was there with President Shabanadze. And uh, I, you know, I think that on the whole, uh, you know, Georgia is, is a much better place than it was uh, in 2003. That said, uh, Misha is more of what I would call a modernizer. Um, I think he's focused more on economic development, which has been, you know, on the whole good, but there's some very difficult spots that remain. Um, and I think he's been a little less focused on democratic development. Um, and uh, one analyst whom I, I have very high regard for, Tom Duvall, who's at uh, Carnegie, wrote an excellent paper about a year ago in which he pointed out that Georgia is in danger of becoming a one-party state. 
and the analogy was to Mexico. And so one party institutionalized in New York. And I think that was a very fair criticism. Uh, the opposition in Georgia is very weak, very fragmented. Uh, Saakashvili uh, controls the executive, the judiciary, the legislature. Uh, the press is, I would say, moderately free. I mean, it, it certainly is controlled to a certain extent. Um, and it's not a, a healthy situation as far as I was concerned in terms of the long-term development of Georgia. Now these parliamentary elections uh, come along, and lo and behold, um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Ivanishvili, Zina Ivanishvili, uh, comes to the fore and uh, is mounting a rather significant uh, opposition to Saakashvili. Ivanishvili is an enigmatic figure. He made billions of dollars uh, in Russia during the, you know, the gold days, you know, right after the fall of the Soviet Union when a lot of oligarchs became very rich with some very nasty and shady dealings. Um, I have asked around a lot with people that I, whose judgment I trust, and every one of them has said, you know, that Ivanishvili is relatively clean. Uh, you know, uh, he was not the typical oligarch, you know, bribing, killing people off. I, I don't know that to be totally correct, but I trust uh, the people that I spoke with. Now, he was active in Georgia, uh, a very reclusive figure, but uh, he is, was very active over the last several years in charitable things. He was giving uniforms to the military, building churches, building schools, and has a very good you know, reputation in Georgia you know, for being a very charitable individual. But he had a falling out with Saakashvili, and he decided you know, that Saakashvili was leading the country in a very non-democratic fashion, and that uh, he was going to jump into the political fray to try to help Georgia come back to its more democratic uh, meetings. Um, so he formed uh, a coalition, an opposition coalition called Georgia Green, and they are now contesting uh, these parliamentary elections. Um, it looks still like Saakashvili's party, uh, the United National Movement, probably win the elections, but they're getting a real run you know, for their money. And uh, what is a little bit bothersome uh, is that both sides are using a lot of American consultants. They're sort of fighting out the battle in Washington because uh, I can remember very well from my time as ambassador to Georgia, you know, they never seemed to have the stamp of approval of the United States. They were just literally fighting you know, to get that. So I was always being asked to come here or do that or meet with some so they could come and take the picture, you know, to do the American ambassador. So they both hired very high price consulting companies and are waging you know, a real struggle you know, here uh, in Washington. And it's a, a rather heated campaign, and uh, I would have to say, uh, you know, that the government side, uh, you know, was, was very much steering it in their own direction. Um, they uh, they took away uh, uh, Ivanishvili. There was a problem with his citizenship, so they took it away. Uh, they finally sort of restored it using a, a, a legislative uh, trick. But uh, bank holdings of his were frozen. His party was fined large amounts of money. Uh, people whom I know quite well, who are members of his coalition, uh, were either beaten up or. Uh, you know, there, there, there are talks around the country that were being sort of hounded by thugs. Uh, it wasn't very pretty. And on the government side, uh, their allegation was that Ivanishvili is basically a Russian puppet, you know, because he made his money in Russia, uh, and that he's really not committed, you know, to NATO and the Western uh, security and economic integration that, that Georgia is under Saakashvili. So the swords have been drawn. I have to tell you, Georgian politics is a blood sport. It's been that way you know, for a long time. And uh, fortunately, so far, no one's been killed, but they still have about two weeks to go before the voting, and I wouldn't rule it out. But the stakes are enormous in this election, not just because whether or not Georgia will have a, um, you know, a, uh, a true opposition, but uh, Saakashvili, uh, uh, managed to have the Constitution of Georgia amended to give the Prime Minister a lot of powers that the, uh, 
president now has. And there was a lot of concern that uh, that Saakashvili was going to pull the Putin, you know, and simply, you know, declare himself prime minister if his party won and stay in power. That is probably less likely now because uh, they've nominated a candidate, Bono Merbashvili, who's uh, Saakashvili's sort of clone, if you will. He's more focused on the security side of things. But uh, he has been nominated to become prime minister if they win. But the latest rumor is that Saakashvili you know, might want to have himself named as Speaker of Parliament. So the issue, there are two issues. One is whether these elections will be free, fair, and open. And there are major questions you know, about that, as I've indicated. Uh, Georgia has been promised NATO membership at a date uncertain. They would also, at some point, like to become a member of the European Union. But neither of those is going to happen as long as you know, their internal politics are in such a mess. Uh, and the Russian occupation, and I'll talk about that, you know, continues of, uh, you know, in uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So these elections are important. You know, a, is a, whether there's going to be a clear transfer of power you know, to a new president, or if Saakashvili going to hang on, and will these elections you know, be free, fair, and open? So what further complicates uh, the situation is the, you know, the, still the ramifications of the war from 2008. The Georgians, as you know, were soundly defeated. I, I won't go into what caused that war and who caused it, but um, uh, no matter which way you look at it, it was a devastating blow to Georgia and Saakashvili. Uh, the Russians, you know, to this day, I think still believe that that was a major victory. They still crow about it. I think it wasn't. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, the facts on the ground is that Russian troops, you know, are in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. They're building military bases there. Russian forces are in still parts of Georgia that are acknowledged as Georgia, you know, not Abkhazia or South Ossetia. And they have not been uh, removed despite the terms of the uh, ceasefire agreement. And the whole Russian-Georgian relationship remains a very, very, very tense one. Uh, personally, Putin and Saakashvili detest each other. Uh, they can barely stand to be in the same room together. Uh, the, the Russians, you know, uh, the, the list of complaints against the Georgians remains very, very long. Georgia wanting to join NATO, Georgia you know, being a great supporter of these east-west oil and gas pipelines. Uh, the fact that you know, Georgia, you know, is not willing to join uh, these various uh, political and economic groupings that Putin is, is pushing now, these various Eurasian uh, uh, you know, unions that he's pushing. But Georgia is staying on the fringes of all that, and so the relationship you know, remains a very, very, very tense one. Um, and the concern you know, with Georgia uh, is that you, know, you read from time to time you know, that with Putin back as president, that uh, he may want to attend to unfinished business, and that is removing, you know, Saakashvili. Uh, that was the one thing that the West really dug its heels on. You know, that Sarkozy, when, when they negotiated the ceasefire agreement, the Russians were basically demanding, you know, that uh, Saakashvili go, and uh, the French, the EU, stuck there, you know, said absolutely not freely elected. He's not, you know, he's not going to be removed. I don't think there was any doubt that that was one of the Russians' war objectives, which wasn't achieved. And I think it's still, you know, it's still on their list. So the Georgia-Russian relationship, you know, in the Caucasus, to me, remains a very dangerous one. As I, I don't see a war coming tomorrow, but it remains, for all the reasons that I've outlined, a very difficult one. And uh, you know the, the Russians have played in Georgian elections, you know, in the past. Uh, they do not seem to be doing it this time. They are not. I think they've kind of learned. They, they've interfered in a lot of elections in that part of the world, including in the Ukraine, and it hasn't worked very well. So I think they're learning to sort of back off a bit. Uh, but uh, as I said, there is this question about Ivanishvili and his foreign policy. So there, there are lots of questions, you know, about Georgia, its direction after these elections, and what the Russians, you know, may or may not do. Uh, the, the, the Georgians are still having, enduring a trade boycott, you know, by the Russians. Um, you know, they, they have virtually no diplomatic, you know, uh, engagement whatsoever. And there's always the problem, the, always the risk of, you know, the, the Russians again 
uh, doing what they did prior to 2008, which was to you know, bake Saakashvili to a point where he felt he had no choice you know, but to attack. And of course, that was a devastating uh, defeat and a very bad decision. So Georgia, uh, you know, is is certainly one you know that uh, that I would would focus on. Um, the second one is Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I'm sure most of you know, you know, the issue there is uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is uh, primarily uh, Armenian ethnically. Uh, it was put into uh, Azerbaijan at the time of the formation of the Soviet Union. Armenia never, you know. They, they had to accept it because it was the Soviet Union that always railed against it. And as the Soviet Union weakened uh, in the 80s, uh, that situation became much more tense. And what you have there is a classic collision of two basic principles of international relations, self-determination and territorial integrity. You know, the Armenians, the nagorno karabakhis say, you know, we're a majority in this area. We should have independence. Uh, we don't want to be part of Azerbaijan. The Azeris say, sorry, you know, this is part of Azeri territory uh, recognized by the international community, and uh, we'll offer you autonomy. They fought a bitter war uh, from roughly, uh, you know, the late 1980s into about 1994. There was a ceasefire, uh, but no, uh, there's no agreement really, uh, there's no peace monitoring force, and it has been a very difficult uh, you know, issue for now what it's um, 18 years uh, you know, unresolved. There have been international negotiations, the Minsk Group, which is the United States, France, Russia, and several others, have been trying to negotiate a conclusion to this thing for years, and unsuccessfully. And there have been a number of bilateral meetings between the Azeris and the Armenians. Uh, we have tried to uh, facilitate, we had a big meeting in Key West, uh, it must be about 10 years ago. Uh, and then Medvedev, when he was president, you know, personally tried to negotiate uh, you know, an end to this conflict. And uh, they apparently had an agreement, uh, and Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was setting up the room already you know, for signing. And the Azeris, according to most reports, uh, backed off. And you know, the real question is, um, you know, the, the, the general way that people see a conclusion to this thing uh, is that uh, there will be some type of a land bridge created between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which would you know, sort of prevent the isolation of that area, uh, and that the, Arme the Armenians would remove their forces, you know, now control about 10% of Azerbaijan territory in addition to Nagorno-Karabakh. And that then there would be some final agreement on the political status of Nagorno-Karabakh, assuming that it would probably become, you know, independent in some way. But every time they seem to get close to signing, uh, it seems like the Azeris pull back, or one uh, the other side pulls back. Now, is this dangerous? Yes. Is it increasingly dangerous? Yes. People say, well, this is frozen. You know, nothing is going to happen. That's what they said about Georgia with, uh, with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and that blew up in 2008. The risks here are that uh, Azerbaijan is increasingly wealthy you know, because of their oil and gas uh, riches. They're earning a lot of money, but they're going to plateau. <coughs> I should ask Dan about this. Uh, their earnings are going to plateau in about another five to eight years, as I understand it. Uh, and they're going to start, you know, slowly, you know, going down. So they're earning the highest amounts that they're going to earn right now, and they're using a lot of that money to uh, buy military equipment, uh, for training. Um, they're buying an awful lot of, of, of stuff, you know, is, is the way I would put it. And Armenia uh, is a much poorer country. It doesn't have the natural resources. It has the advantage of the large. Uh, Armenian diaspora, you know, which does uh, provide a lot of investment and support uh, to Armenia. But Armenia has been blockaded, you know, by Turkey. Uh, the only borders that Armenia has opened now are, are to Iran and, and Georgia. Uh, and that's it's proved to be a very, very difficult uh, economic uh, obstacle uh, for Armenia. So their economy has weakened. And Armenia is slowly being depopulated. 
lots of their young people are leaving the country because there's no opportunity. Uh, the Armenian economy is sort of in a stranglehold right now of some oligarchs who are very well connected politically, so the economy is not doing well. And the tripwires that we're most concerned about, there's been an increase in sniping incidents. As I said, there's no peace monitoring or peacekeeping force uh, in the, beyond the borders, uh, the ceasefire borders in the Karno-Karabakh. And the number of sniping incidents has increased. Uh, they're, they're getting worrisome. Uh, you know, you read periodically five Armenian soldiers being killed and three Azeri soldiers being killed. Uh, the military buildup is going on, but the latest event is, is a very strange one diplomatically and again contributing to the, uh, you know, to the uh, problems. But there was a, um, an Azeri lieutenant uh, who was at a, uh, some type of a NATO training event, uh, I believe it was uh, about eight or ten years ago in Budapest in Hungary. Had a big fight with some Armenian officers who were, they were in the same like dormitory. And apparently this um, uh, Azri officer by the name of Safarov took an ax and almost decapitated uh, one of the uh, Armenian officers and was attacking the other one when you know, people heard the screams and came in and stopped it. Uh, this officer was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison in, uh, in Hungary. And then lo and behold, about a month ago, uh, this officer was sent back to Azerbaijan by the government, that the government of Hungary and the government of Azerbaijan had worked this out to repatriate this prisoner and supposedly have him serve the rest of his term in prison uh, in Azerbaijan. Well, what happened, as soon as the guy got back, he was greeted as a hero at the airport. His uh, sentence was commuted. He was promoted to major. He was given a new apartment and feted, you know, as a, a national hero. Well, of course, uh, this was all prearranged. This was premeditated, and this just didn't happen. And the question is sort of why Hungary, you know, did this. It was obvious what was going to happen. And uh, there are other problems with Hungary right now. I don't know if any of you are following that, but uh, the Orban government is a big issue, you know, for within NATO itself. But anyway, uh, this Safarov, you know, is now back. Um, Clearly, the major impact is internal, you know, in Azerbaijan. This is a major domestic, you know, uh, boost to uh, Aliyev. And, you know, the government in Azerbaijan, unfortunately, is another, you know, authoritarian government, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty rough uh, in many ways. And this, of course, is a great way to sort of feed red meat to the nationalists. But uh, the Armenians are furious about this. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember if the Armenians have broken diplomatic ties with Hungary. If they haven't, they, have. they pardon me, they have. They have, they have. That's what I thought. I mean, they're furious and, and with reason uh, in this case. And uh, so their ties are bad. And the tension level, I would say, again, is, is, is high. Now, the question is, will there be a war? Um, this one you could argue a lot of different ways. A good friend of mine who's a former ambassador to um, Azerbaijan says no. Um, he thinks that Aliyev would not risk it, uh, that the dangers, you know, the Russians have a, a defensive treaty alliance with Armenia, and his point was that you know, if the Armenia, Azeris do attack, that the Russians you know, may come to the defense of, of, Ar of Armenia. I don't know that, but the, the risks of a conflict are the following. I've said the Russians are pretty much allied with Armenia. Um, Azerbaijan is their closest international supporter is Turkey. Turkey is a NATO member. And during the fighting in the Garno Karabakh about, uh, what was it, about 18, whatever it was, 20 years ago, there was a real risk at one point that the Armenians were going to push too far. Uh, and that um, uh, there, was a, there was a risk that the Turks were going to come in, the Iranians looked like they were going to come in, and there was a risk of, a, you know, of a, a Turkey fighting Russia, which meant you know, a NATO country fighting Russia. So I mean, that's what the problem with NK is. If you, it's the daisy chain of what could happen there if, uh, if hostilities you know, broke out again. I myself think that uh, the most likely possible scenario for conflict there 
um, is the Azeris trying to do what uh, the Egyptians did, um, uh, you know, what Sadat did in, in 1970, you know, that war, uh, 73, the Yom Kippur War, when, you know, uh, you know they, they knew they were probably going to get beaten, but they crossed the Suez Canal, uh, surprised the Israelis, you know, inflicted a lot of damage before they were pulled back. And that raised, you know, I think the self-confidence of the Egyptians and Sadat, you know, ultimately to negotiate, you know, the Camp David Accord. And I, I kind of think that it's that kind of a scenario which maybe in, you know, maybe in uh, Aliyev's mind, I don't know. But I simply point to this as another festering conflict that remains unresolved and could, could, you know, blow up again. The third area um, is the area that I think we know least about, and it's, again, very, very dangerous, and that's the North Caucasus of Russia. I'm talking about uh, Ingushetia, Dagestan, Chechnya, uh, and the, you know, all the various, um, you know, uh, regions that come uh, further to the west uh, in, in the North Caucasus. Um, you all know about the, the Chechen War, and Professor Stent, you know, mentioned the, uh, the award that really my embassy got. I, I happened to be the ambassador, so it was given to me. But helping to prevent that war, the, first, the second Russian-Chechen war that went from 1999, you know, almost till today. I mean, it's, it's not completely resolved. But uh, to prevent that war from spilling over uh, into Georgia in late 1999, when it looked as if the Russians, you know, were possibly uh, going to do something. Chechnya, uh, I won't say has been pacified, but uh, it's, it has been brutalized, I think, into submission uh, you know, at the time being. Uh, the the uh, atrocities on both sides in that war are, are unspeakable, I and mean, no one uh, you know, gets away clean uh, you know, from that particular war. But I would have to say that you know, the Russians, by massive applications of force, um, uh, lots of killing of young people, uh, and then now using you know a local uh, warlord as their uh, you know as their political puppet, if you will. I have pretty much pacified Chechnya, but it, it still remains a very dicey situation. Both in Dagestan and uh, Ingushetia, though, uh, there are you know the insurgencies are mounting. Um, I was just reading a couple of articles. Uh, and one person was writing that, uh, uh, that uh, Ingushetti is on the edge of chaos. And in Dagestan, uh, the headlines were that uh, self-defense units are being asked to be created by the various national uh, ethnic groups you know, in Dagestan. Dagestan is a patchwork of ethnic groups in the North Caucasus. And uh, the analysts are very concerned about this because of each you know, smallish group in Dagestan has its own self-defense unit. What is this going to mean? Are they going to start fighting each other? Are they going to direct these, uh, you know, forces against the, the Dagestani government? Uh, but the situation in the North Caucasus, and again, this is, you know, largely, you know, uh, Islamic, you know, directed against uh, the local authorities. Um, and many of the local authorities, of course, are Russian appointees and, you know, beholden to them. Um, in the western part of the uh, North Caucasus, uh, the danger there is uh, those areas have not been quite as uh, prominent in the unrest until recently. And the big concern there is the Winter Olympics coming up in 2014, which are going to be in Sochi, you know, in, in, in Russia. Sochi, for those of you who may not realize it, you know, was a North Caucasian city, a, a Circassian city. Uh, it was, that was, you know, a major home of the Circassians. The Circassians uh, and other, and the Abkhaz uh, were brutalized by the Russians in the 19th century when the Russians were conquering the North Caucasus. And um, you had very significant uh, revolts against the Russians, the Shamir, Shamil, revolt in the eastern part of the North Caucasus. The Russians dealt with that first after about 30 years. And then uh, the western part of the North Caucasus also went into revolt. And the Russians dealt with that in an even more difficult way 
Uh, they either expelled or, or killed an awful lot of people, and most of the Circassians, uh, about a million of them were exiled. And you will find uh, Circassians today in Syria, in Jordan, and in Turkey. And there are more Abkhaz uh, in Turkey today than there are in Abkhazia as a result of that. So what's happening with 2014? Well, with these Olympics there, uh, Circassian groups are now alleging, you know, that they want what the Russians did in the 19th century to, to be declared a genocide. Uh, and the concern is that there may be terrorism, you know, directed at those Olympics uh, in 2014. Now to connect all of this uh, into what we were talking about before, the award that our embassy got was to prevent, help prevent the Chechen war from spilling over, you know, into Russia. And the problem uh, those years ago was that there's an area of Georgia called the Pankisi Gorge, uh, which is about, I don't know, maybe 50 miles, you know, from uh, Tbilisi as the crow flies. But it's just a few miles from the Russian border uh, with Chechnya. And uh, there are uh, ethnic um, Chechens living there called Kists, who were refugees from these wars with Russia, you know, 150 years ago. Well, when the second uh, Chechen war began, uh, about 6,000 Chechens fled to the Georgian border, uh, you know, trying to get away from the fighting. And we pressed the Georgians very hard, I was ambassador then, to admit these people on humanitarian grounds. The Georgians finally did that, but what they did was to place all of these people in the Pankisi Gorge with these older, you know, Chechens who had been there over a hundred years, and it was like oil and water. They did not get along very well. But to truncate this story, what the Russians were alleging was that amongst these 6,000 people were a number of Boyaviki, of fighters, and that they were going back into Chechnya fighting the Russians, and if only the Russians could come into the Pankisi Gorge, clean this up, that that would be the end of the insurgency in Chechnya. And it got to be very, very scary. Um, the uh, Shevardnadze called me in one day and said, uh, you know, Kenneth, I have to tell you about something that very serious happened. This was October, almost uh, 13 years ago. It was October of 1999. He said, um, uh, Yeltsin was just on the phone with me asking for permission to use the three Russian military bases that were then in Georgia to attack uh, the Chechens from the south. They were coming down from the north. And Shevardnadze told me that uh, I have refused permission. And he said, the Russians will never forget this. But he, his exact words were, we have never said no to the Russians for 150 years, and they will never forget this. And he was right. Uh, because we were very worried thereafter, you know, that the Russians were either directly or indirectly going to come into Georgia in the uh, Pankisi Gorge. It took place, uh, what was it, um, 11 years later, um, I think that's right, uh, uh, not nine years later. But uh, anyway, my concern is that if the situation in the North Caucasus continues to roil, we have an op-ed in the uh, Herald Tribune, New York Times, a couple of weeks ago, calming the roiling caucuses. Uh, my concern uh, is that if this, these insurgencies, you know, in the North Caucasus continue to grow, the Russians, I, I, maybe some of them would disagree with me, and I'd love to have that discussion. I don't think they know how to handle this. Uh, they've tried force, uh, they've tried economic subsidies, nothing works. They have not tried political methods, which are probably the only thing that would work and they refuse, uh, you know, to do that. Um, there are voices in, you know, in Moscow already who are saying, you know, we've lost the North Caucasus, we should just jettison it. And others are saying, you know, that's ridiculous, just go down and kill some more people and, you know, get tough. So I'm not sure that they really know, you know, what to do uh, with the North Caucasus. And my concern is that we could have a repeat of what happened in 1999. Uh, you know, lots of, uh, you know, insurgencies, uh, terrorist acts, and the Russians, you know, may again want to blame Azerbaijan and Georgia as they did, you know, uh, years earlier, and uh, that we may run the risk again of some type of Russian action, either direct or indirect, against either Georgia or Azerbaijan as a result of this. So to conclude, um, I hope that I, you know, made your 
you know, the, the, you know, the bristles on your back go up a little bit. Uh, as I say, I, you know, this is not Syria. Uh, this is not the Middle East. Uh, this is not Afghanistan, you know, in terms of, you know, immediate fighting and immediate crises. But, uh, you know, given what happened in 2008 when everybody was sure that all these conflicts were frozen and everybody went to sleep at the switch, uh, I just keep going out and saying, uh, keep awake. So let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much for an uplifting and upbeat <laughs> presentation. Um, the sad thing is, well, I guess if you'd given this talk five years ago, the war hadn't happened with Russia, but all of these issues were still there, or even ten years ago. Let me just ask you the first question. Um, you obviously have talked about Georgian-Russian relations, and we know that not good. Uh, Armenian-Russian relations are pretty good. How would you characterize Azerbaijan's relationship with Russia? I mean, particularly question. since the Georgian war, where I think we could all agree, right, everyone woke up the next day and thought, the people in that neighborhood, yeah, I guess here we are in the neighborhood, you know, we have to deal with this. So how would you characterize this? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, I have to begin that, though, by, by just telling one story, because I, I, I love this. Um, Azerbaijan and Georgia have pretty warm relationships. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, are the Azeri, I'm sorry, the, the Azeri Georgian relationship, uh, Azeri Armenian relationship is very bad as I've explained. Georgia is the one that talks, you know, to, you know, to both of them. And, uh, but the Georgian Armenian relationship is, is correct but not warm. Uh, there's a large, uh, both uh, Azeri and Armenian minority in Georgia. And uh, the Azeris are, seem pretty well integrated, you know, into Georgia. I've never really heard of it. The Armenians, it's a little bit different. They were eaten out in an area that was very sort of distant and cut off, and there were economic issues. There was a Russian base there. And I think the Georgians were always worried that if the Dashnaks, you know, got active, that there might be some separatism. So, uh, and also the Armenians are much closer to the Russians than the Georgians, so that relationship is, is, is a little, you know, a little dicey. But um, the, the story that I just simply wanted to say before answering the question is, um, when I was ambassador, I went to uh, Azerbaijan once for a chief submission meeting, and the Russians were in the midst of cutting off gas supplies, you know, to the Russian, uh, to the Georgians, you know, making life miserable, uh, correctly because the bills were not paid. But they always did it like on Christmas Eve and New Year's, and you know, to send a real lesson. So anyway, I went. Uh, with two other ambassadors, and we saw the old president of Leo, Haidar Leo. Um, and boy, he was a real piece of work, let me tell you. He's a former KGB general, and you would not want to tamper with him. But anyway, I, I was talking to him, and I said, Mr. President, I see I'm the ambassador, U.S. ambassador in Georgia, and the, you know, Georgia has these very severe gas shortages. You know, would you consider you know, redirecting some gas from Azerbaijan to Georgia? And he said, oh, he said, I would love to do it, but it's such a cold winter, and we have shortages, I just can't do it. So I went back to Tbilisi, and the first time I saw Shevardnadze, I said, Mr. President, you know, I, I tried. I said, I, I at least asked Mr. Aliyev on your behalf. Uh, and Shevardnadze looked at me, and he said, ah, hi there, Aliyev. My blood brother, except when it comes to money. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the reason I mention that is Aliyev, uh, I think, was much better at dealing with the Russians than uh, Shevardnadze. Um, I, they, they, the, 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 the Russians hated Shevardnadze for his role in negotiating, you know, the end of the Soviet Union. They regarded him as a traitor. They regard Georgia as a traitor. Uh, and they just feel, you know, Georgia is mush, and you know, you know this, this, this is, this is no good. Azerbaijan, I think, is, you know, is a bit different. Um, I don't think there is that emotional tie of the Russians, you know, to Azerbaijan. You know, Georgia, you know, with all the great Russian, you know, writers, Pushkin, Lermontov, Tolstoy, they all wrote about, you know, the Caucasus and Georgia, and you know, you don't have that that linkage, uh, but. Aliyev, the Haider, I think, was much more adept at dealing with the Russians. Uh, you know, the Russians were just as angry at the Azeris about the Chechens and, you know, support. And Haider, Aliyev, cut a deal with the Russians. I don't know what he did, but the Russians stopped complaining. I think he sent back uh, a few Chechens, you know, uh, and that was the end of it. And, uh, you know, yeah, the Russians tried to assassinate Aliyev over the East-West pipelines. Sure, I mean, all that went on. 
but I think when the pipeline decisions were made, I, I, I just had the feeling that they had sort of agreed, you know, uh, you know on what they could agree upon uh, and, and disagree on what they could agree, you know, what they're going to disagree upon. The relationship, I think, today is a good one. I think the Russians, you know, again, it's, it's oil, uh, and you have the Russians sort of looking at it in, in two ways. Um, I don't have any doubt in my mind that the Russians still would love to control the export of oil, you know, from that region of the world, and the, and the Azeris, you know, don't want that as the Baku Tbilisi Cheyhan pipeline, you know, exemplified, you know, that pipeline through Georgia, through Turkey, you know, to the west. But I think Aliyah, you know, they have managed to just keep it at a correct, you know, not warm level, but a correct, polite, you know, level. There isn't the acrimony, there isn't the personal uh, anger that you have between uh, Saakashvili and, and, and Putin. Um, but it, it's not warm because they know that ultimately, you know, uh, and I think also the Azeris have not been as open in this desire to join NATO. You know, I mean, the Georgians have really made that a goal of national policy, whereas the Azeris sort of talk about it, but it, it's not right up there. And they were not along with, uh, you know, Ukraine promised neonatal membership. So it's, it, it's just not quite as, as heated uh, a relationship. And I would, want, I would just want to say one thing about going back to Nagorno-Karabakh. For a long time, I think there was a perception that the Russians, you know, wanted to keep all these unresolved situations boiling. Uh, the one in Transnistria with Moldova, uh, the, the Georgian situation, because, you know, keeping Abkhazia and South Ossetia out of the Georgian hands, you know, to keep that stranglehold of Moscow on Tbilisi. And on MK, Nagaro Karabakh, I think there were similar feelings until recently. And I think now uh, there is a general sense, which I accept, that the Russians really do want an end. They don't want a repeat of the Nagaro Karabakh war. They see exactly what I was talking about, that it could, you know, spread and get very, very dangerous. And Medvedev, you know, put a lot of his own personal credibility in, in trying to negotiate, uh, you know, an agreement. You know, it didn't work. But I, I just get the sense, you know, that, that the Russian aims in that part of the world are more sort of traditional, you know, what you would expect from a, you know, a regional power dealing with, you know, a, a, you know, a sort of a sub-regional power, and not like Georgia, where they are definitely, you know, trying to do some pretty nasty things. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thank you, Ambassador. For this I have two questions actually. Uh, one is has to do with Abkhazia. Yeah. Um, do you see in the near future a change of policy, Western policy towards Abkhazia, in a way that professors uh, Kuli of Columbia University suggested as uh, engagement without recognition? Do you see such policy change towards Abkhazia in the near future? And the second is uh, about social peace. You mentioned about a terrorist attack by the Circassians to Olympics. Um, one of the descendants of Sikhians deported to Turkey, as myself, I don't see it's, it's a, uh, a much likelihood, but uh, the campaign against such is uh, going on on a moral basis, and that's uh, uh, telling the world that the land uh, that the Olympics would be held is actually a Sikhian land, uh, and Russia occupied it, not an uh, original Russian land, and there are some <coughs> historical injustices is done to Circassians and they need uh, reparation for it. So, but how much do you think Russians take this in, in seriously? How do you think uh, this poses threat to Russia? Uh, what's the Russian point of view on this? Very good questions and thank you, thank you for your, your commentary. Um, I don't think, I know Alex uh, well and uh, I, I, I don't agree with him on this particular issue. Um, I, you know, U.S. policy, the Europeans, you know, we are all agreed, you know, on uh, not recognizing Abkhazia uh, in South Ossetia. We put a, a pretty large diplomatic effort, you know, to not to uh, uh, encourage others. I think only three or four, you know, it's Guatemala, Papua New Guinea, I mean, I mean it's ridiculous. Nauru. 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 Yeah, I don't remember which. <laughs> But I mean, you know, the Russians have had abysmal success in uh, even including, you know, the other former you know, Soviet republics. No one has recognized, even Belarus hasn't recognized. 
uh, I don't see that changing because um, that would in effect mean uh, a, a recognition of Russia changing the borders of the former Soviet Union by force. That would be the first time, you know, that was I think the first time that this has happened. And I, I just do not see any change in policy on that coming, you know, in, in the near future. Um, uh, one of the things that was very difficult when I was there, you know, is that, uh, you know, wh what do you do with Abkhazia and South Ossetia? You know, you can't ignore them completely. And so what we did as a government, uh, we were provided humanitarian aid. And, and uh, we allowed, you know, non-governmental organizations, you know, to work there. Um, uh, the Georgians didn't like it, but we went ahead and did it. And I used to go to Sukhumi, you know, fairly often, you know, for talks and also just to see what was going on, you know, with, with our projects. But uh, I can see that going on, but I, I just cannot see a change in policy on Abkhazia. I mean, as I said, uh, perhaps very limited economic uh, but the thing that we always told the Georgians was, first of all, that they were not really offering the uh, Abkhaz and South Ossetians anything real. I and mean, they had never really put forth what, what autonomy meant and what they were going to offer. And the other thing that I think was always very difficult was we said, you're really not making it attractive for them to come back. Uh, you should be working on your economy. You should be working to develop your democracy. and make, Georgia a more desirable place, you know, for Abkhazia and South Ossetia, you know, to come back to. And, uh, you know, that, that didn't happen either. And there, there are reasons on both sides why that happened. I mean, uh, the Georgians are not blameless, and the Abkhaz and the South Ossets are not blameless. It was a, a very, very sad, you know, series of events, you know, that led up to it. But the long and short of it is I do not, I, I, I just don't see, uh, you know, in terms of formal recognition, I, do, I don't see that happening. Now, you're absolutely right, you know, and you know far better than I on, on what, you know, the Circassian, you know, the, it is the moral high ground. But the only thing that I would point out is that, you know, the war in Chechnya kind of began that way too. It was the moral high ground. It was, you know, fighting for independence and it degenerated. Uh, it degenerated for a lot of reasons uh, and it became brutal and terroristic, you know, on, uh, you know, on both sides. And I just am concerned, you know, as the time goes on and as this insurgency elsewhere in the North Caucasus continues to grow, that it may, you know, it, it may ultimately impact on, it's too juicy of a target. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think, you know, one of the things that we've been suggesting uh, to the governments in the area, uh, like it or not, you know, is to cooperate with the Russians, you know, to help prevent terrorist incidents, uh, you know, at, at those Olympics. That's in nobody's interest to have that happen. But I don't discount that possibility. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay. No, no, no. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for sharing your deep knowledge of the region. Uh, my name is Fernando. I'm a Spanish French service officer and a ah, current okay. MSFS student. And I'd like to ask you uh, two questions. First, what do you think uh, should be the role of the European Union in that area? And second, what is Iran doing? <laughs> is there? But I haven't heard to any... Yeah, good, good, good question. What do I want the European Union to do? A lot more. I, I've written a lot of op-eds and uh, with two former ambassadors, and uh, almost in every one of them were saying, where is the European Union? Where is the European Union? Uh, I have to say, though, I, I do uh, credit uh, President Sarkozy and the European Union. We did not uh, get in the middle uh, you know, between the Russians and the Georgians in 2008. We had our reasons not to do it, because uh, we didn't want to make it a Russia-US you know, bilateral standoff. Uh, and the Europeans, I think, you know, stepped up to home plate and may not have done a totally perfect job, but did you know a reasonably good job of stopping the hostilities and preventing uh, you know uh, Saakashvili from getting you know uh, booted out. Uh, but I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that you know, the various EU policies, the labor policies, the various other, they just haven't been enough. And I don't think that the EU, you know, I think the EU's interest in in that area of the world has primarily been economic. You know probably less political. And I, I kind of think, you know, 
we're all grown-ups now, you know. I think you know, it's very hard for you with 27 countries, you know, to, to get any agreed policies. But I think it's time, you know, you know, to do that. And uh, what I would love to see, but we've always been recommending, is that the EU, the United States, and the Russians, you know, really sit down to talk about the caucuses, you know, to figure out what are your red lines, what are our red lines, you know, and that, that hasn't happened. So uh, I would like to see the EU be a lot more active, uh, assuming that we're all on the same way, you know, which I, I think is correct. And what was the second question? Uh, Iran. <laughs> Iran, okay. Well, Iran is fascinating because periodically when I was ambassador to Georgia, we had to talk to the Georgians about their ties to Iran. Uh, not diplomatic, or any, I think they do have diplomatic relations, but, um, uh, and now even Saakashvili has been kind of, you know, uh, playing around, you know, with Iran, so we would periodically have to tell the Georgians, you know, watch, watch, watch what you're doing. Um, the role of Iran, though, in the area is fascinating. You know, the Iranians are Shia, the Azeris are Shia, and yet they're, they came down on the opposite sides over the Garno Karabakh. And I think, you know, for those of you who know the, re the region, the answer is that there's something like 25 million uh, Azeri, ethnic Azeris living in northern uh, Iran. And the thing that the, Arme uh, uh, the Iranians have always been concerned about is that if the Azeris, you know, sort of take the upper hand over the governor Karabakh, that they will do what the Russians tried to do at the end of World War II, you know, sort of try to extract that group from uh, Iran and, and link them with, uh, with Azerbaijan. So the Iranians uh, have had a pretty close relationship with Armenia. They're providing them with gas. Uh, and uh, the iranian Azeri relationship has been, you know, I, I would say pretty tense. Uh, the Azeris periodically are concerned about uh, more. The Azeris are very moderate, you know, Shia. They have very good relationships with Israel, which Iran detests. Uh, and so as I say, the iranian Azeri relationship is, is a bad one. The Iranian-Armenian one is pretty good, and the Georgians is sort of on the fringes. But the, uh, what the Armeni Ar Iranians always want is to keep us out and to keep the EU out. That's their major objective, is to keep us from getting any further into the area. So they're always siding with anything or anybody, you know, that will diminish our role. Um, I, I would not call them a major player, but they're out there. You know, they're they're watching very, very, very carefully. And I've had um, Armenia, I've had Azeris, I'm sorry, I've had Armenians tell me that they're concerned if that there if there's an Israeli strike on Iran or an Israeli U.S. strike on Iran that uh, the Azeris might use the opportunity uh, to attack uh, Armenia uh, because, I mean, because Iran, would, which would, might normally side with uh, Armenia, would be you know, focused elsewhere. And uh, uh, Armenians that I've spoken to you know, have said that their concern is if uh, nothing's going on with these negotiations, as I've outlined, nothing is, that ultimately you know, the Azeris may resort to force. So I think the Iranians are watching all of this too, but I think they're mostly watching. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my question also goes back to the, a role for the U.S. in their national community in the North Caucasus and what you think that should be, but more specifically in regards to the terrorism in the North Caucasus. The international community, by and large, tend to kind of leave that situation to Russia. And the radicalization has been steadily happening since 2002. Yep. But it wasn't until 2011 that the UN and the US started recognizing the Caucasus Emory. Um, you, you talked about that you're worried it's spillover. And yep. we've seen that. Three weeks ago, there was the, yep. in, in, the in Georgia earlier right. this year, there yep. was the plot in Azerbaijan and Baku. Yep. And there's been European plots in, in, in still in Spain and in Belgium and in cells in Czechoslovakia that all have ties to the Caucasus yep. region. Is there something that U.S. or, in your opinion, the U.S. or international community should be doing to address it more? I mean, it doesn't really ever show up in the media as far as the daily violence so there. Very, very good question, and it goes back to um, when we've been writing. That's one of the things that we've been suggesting that the U.S. and the EU ought to do. The problem is that the Russians have put up a you know, blockade around that area. Um, excuse me, they refuse to have uh, any outside observers. Um, 
They refuse to have uh, the OSCE get involved. Uh, they, they, they're refusing, you know, they refuse humanitarian assistance. I mean, they're basically saying this is ours and you have no role here, you know, whatsoever. Um, we think, you know, uh, that's a very, very short-sighted policy because I don't think they know how to handle that area. And, um, uh, but again, this is, you know, for those of us who have dealt with, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union a long time, uh, extremely, as most countries are, extremely sensitive about, you know, letting anybody in, you know, on your, on your territory. And that has been their sort of unwavering, uh, situ you know, the unwavering position. And, you know, you can raise it, you can talk about it, uh, which I think, you know, our representatives at the OSCE have done, but the Russians are not going to, you know, allow anybody in, at least for now. Um, that's why I think probably the best that could be done, you know, is for us to talk about it and keep telling the Russians that if you ever, you know, decide to change your viewpoint and recognize that you could use a little bit of help, you know, we're here to try to do that. We're not here to blacken your image. We're not here to, you know, shame you. We're trying to help. But I, I don't know if anybody has another approach. I'd love to know. But that's pretty much where things are. I had sort of had a very similar question to these past two. Mm -hmm. Just to add another element to the North Caucasus situation, uh, what you think about the Georgian sort of charm offensive with Circassians, in particular yep. with the North Caucasus generally, <laughs> and whether that's having any traction, yeah. and whether that's having any effect on Russia's policy towards this? That's a very good question. Um, I frankly am a little concerned, uh, to put it okay. mildly. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, um, Saakashvili is a very, very interesting guy in a lot of ways. I knew him quite well when he was, you know, a, a minister and a, a leading member of parliament. Always wanted to be president, and you know, it was quite clear he made no bones about it, you know, what, you know, whatsoever. Um, but I, I, there is a little bit of fishing in troubled waters here that it is potentially dangerous. Uh, you know, the Georgians have been offering uh, visas, if I recall correctly, uh, to North Caucasus, North, uh, peoples in the North Caucasus they've taken on, which is a very legitimate, you know, position on, on behalf of the Circassians. There's no question that, you know, some horrible things happened, you know, 150 years ago that, that should not just be buried away. But uh, it just adds, I think, to the list of irritants, you know, between, uh, you know, the Russians, you know, and the Georgians. And um, I, 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 I just, you know, I, I can understand why the Georgians are doing it, but I'm just concerned that it may, it may be just another, you know, irritant. I, I would like to see them do things diplomatically, a little quieter, you know, without, uh, without the fanfare. I think you can be much more effective, you know, I always do as a diplomat, you can be much more effective, you know, quietly and behind the scenes and talking, you know, than setting up radio stations and television stations and, you know, doing, and doing uh, what's, what's happening. So that's my sense of it. <laughs> yes. In the back. Oh, yeah. oh uh, on the South African high school student potential as SFS student. Great. And, Welcome. Come. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering about what what do you foresee uh, uh, with Turkish Arme Armenian relations in the future? Because um, I've I've sort of read about some slight warming yeah. in the relationship uh, with the current Turkish government. I think there was a high profile yeah. visit uh, to Armenia, one of the first in the republic. I think the first in the republic yeah. period. So. Um, See, that's why I still love Georgetown. Your two questions are great. You've hit every everything that I should have covered, you know, and more. Uh, yes, um, the U.S. was very active in trying to promote a uh, Turkish-Armenian rapprochement, uh, and for very good reasons. Um, uh, you know, the the issue of what happened in 1915 is still a very extremely difficult issue. Um, you know, the Armenian side, you know, uh, obviously the mass killings in 1915. Uh, and the question, of course, is, is it a genocide? And, you know, the Armenians are pushing worldwide, you know, to get parliaments and governments, you know, to declare it as, as a genocide. And the Turks, of course, are vehemently opposed to it. They're also opposed, you know, they took different sides, you know, and the Nagorno-Karabakh, so I think there, there are two very, very, very difficult issues, you know, between them. That said, you know, they're neighbors. Um, 
There's a lot of trade that goes on sub rosa uh, across the border and through different you know areas. And uh, I think everybody has recognized, as I said earlier, the Russians, that the NK situation is not a good one and that you really ought to try to normalize you know, relations in that part of the world. And um, what happened was uh, uh, there was a, the, the soccer diplomacy. I can't remember if the Turks came to Armenia or the Armenians came to, um, to Turkey. But you know, there, there was the beginning of a dialogue and then negotiations. And, um, the negotiations were actually rather fruitful and, and agreements were negotiated and they were about to be signed. And what happened was, um, I wasn't directly involved, so I, what I'm saying is just based on news reports, but the Turks apparently were willing to reopen the border and establish diplomatic relations without the Armenians withdrawing you know, military forces you know, from you know, the region around the Garo Karabakh and without progress being made on NK, in other words, delinking the two issues. Um, when this became public, the Azeris went ballistic uh, because, you know, their belief is, you know, that if you give away, um, you know, if you, if you allow the Turks and the Armenians to reestablish diplomatic relations without the Armenians paying for it, you know, without removing their troops or doing something uh, on the Garo Karabakh, that that's a major form of leverage that has been lost. So they were furious with the United States. They were furious, you know, with uh, Turkey, uh, and the Turks ultimately uh, changed their position and and said finally, you know, that um, we will only do this, you know, if the Armenians pull their forces out, you know, and if progress is made on the Garno Karabakh. So in effect, putting the thing back into the refrigerator, you know, you know where it was before. Uh, from my friends who follow this a lot more closely than I do, I think there's virtually nothing left of the Turkish, you know, Armenian uh, rapprochement. Uh, you know, there, you know, there may be some discussions that go on, but at the diplomatic level, I think it's it's pretty much you know, frozen. Sam, you your hand back? Oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that Georgia is in danger of kind of teetering towards a one-party uh, government a la Mexico. Is that a concern to the Georgian people? Recent history shows that a lot of states and regions in the FSU are pretty comfortable with a one-party good place. Very good question. A very good question. Um, it all depends on who you talk with. You know, Georgia, I think is the way I would put it. Um, when you're in Tbilisi, and it's really ironic because Tbilisi is, you would expect the capital city would be a bastion of support for the government, and it's not really. Uh, the opposition is probably strongest, you know, in Tbilisi, uh, and it's out in the countryside, uh, you know, that, uh, that the government has the strongest, you know, support. And, um, you know, I would say if you ask, you know, the Tbilisi intelligentsia, a lot of them would say this is not healthy, you know, that uh, this is not good. Because that's in effect, you know, what has given steam to uh, Ivanishvili's campaign because you know, he's got a lot of people, you know, who are working with him. The majority of the population, it, it may be correct, uh, you know, all through the former Soviet Union, you know, you know, stability, Belarus, I mean, second round, the elections in Belarus are rigged, but I'm convinced uh, Lukashenko could probably win them anyway. Uh, because the population, you know, it's still relatively stable, relatively peaceful. Uh, people's pensions are being paid, and I think that means a lot, you know, to even today, 20 years after the collapse of, you know, of the Soviet Union. But uh, the reason I was smiling when you asked the question, because, you know, we, I think, you know, want, you know, the West wants to see an opposition, the West wants to see a parliamentary, a real parliamentary democracy. Uh, and again, it's this issue, you know, are we prescribing, you know, something that uh, they may not want. Georgia, though, from what I, I've seen of Georgians and the Georgian body politic, I, I do think that they would want, uh, I, I think that they would aspire, you know, to that. But it's uh, not a clear-cut case and a very good question. I mean, one question that I always marvel about is how Saakashvili survived that horrible defeat in 2008. Uh, his, his polling numbers were in the basement, and yet he survived. He survived because the West stepped in with a huge amount of economic assistance, um, and there wasn't an alternative. Uh, and 
So I mean, you know, the, the real lack in Georgia has been of a credible opposition. Uh, I'm not sure that Yovanishvili is, is a credible opposition figure, but there's someone you know who works with him, uh, Irakli Alazani, who was the Georgian ambassador to the UN, um, whose father was a Georgian general and was killed in Abkhaz. He was a, a hero, and it's interesting because the Abkhaz regard that general as a hero as well because he stayed with his troops and he was a very brave man. And Alazani was responsible for the negotiations between uh, Abkhazia and Georgia and was making progress. Um, he, uh, I think a lot of people have high regard for him. He's not a charismatic figure, though Saakashvili is. And I think if there were an opposition figure, you know, a true Democrat you know, with charisma, I think he would do well. I think he would do well. Well, we had President Saakashvili here a few months ago speaking at Georgetown with his students, asking him a question, not quite your question, but about sort of, are you going to pull a Putin or whatever? And his answer then was just, you know, don't make me a lame duck yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, he, and then the second part of that is, how could I do a Putin, considering you know how I feel about yes, Putin. No, but he didn't give me an answer at all. I mean, of course not. No, I mean, that's, uh, he's he's yes. a he, he's a, an extremely talented guy. What's happened though, which I think is unfortunate, his reputation has really been sullied uh, in a lot of places and in Europe. Um, yeah, I think it's well known there are several uh, leaders major, of major, leaders of major countries that do not like him. <laughs> So I mean, I think he, you know, possibly could have gone from being president of Georgia to a major post at the UN, but I, I, I kind of doubt. So, question is, what's where's he yeah, going? What does he do? And he's he, young, young guy. Exactly. So I don't know. But stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you very much. Depressed you. Depressed you. Us. No, but this was a great talk. My pleasure. My Thanks. pleasure. Thank you very much.